Welcome back to Half the Battle. I'm your host as always, Daniel Levy, your co-host Shaq. We're going to be talking to the number one contender in the welterweight division, Colby Covington. He's looking to take on Tyron Woodley, the champ, later on this year. He's going to tell you when he's looking to fight him, and he had a lot to say. And then we're joined by the man that just went toe-to-toe -to -toe with John Lineker. I'm talking about Marlon Chito Vera. If you guys never seen him fight before, now you know what he's all about. He went in there with John Lineker. He ate the shots like a champ. He came back and won that third round. And then we're going to be talking to Eric Anders. He's taking on Marcus Perez at UFC Fresno. It's a newcomer who's coming off wins over Paulo Tiago, Ildemar Alcantara. And now uh, Eric's got the chance to go out there and continue his win streak. Just like you knocked out Rafael Natal, he's looking to take out Marcus Perez. And then we're going to talk to Damian Beatdown Brown. He's taking on Frank Camacho this weekend at UFC Sydney. It's going to be a hell of a fight. Both those guys come to fight, and uh, Damian's looking to get back on track here. But before we talk to our guests, Shaq, Dustin Poirier and Anthony Pettis just had, you know, it was about to be fight of the year. I know the ending was a little anticlimactic, but up until that point, what an incredible fight they had. I mean, it was a, a typical Dustin Poirier fight. Name one boring fight this guy has. You can't. All of his fights are exciting, and that's just the way he fights. And uh, he went out there and got the job done, bro. I mean... I feel like, you know, Pettis has been on the decline. Yes, I know RDA took a lot out of him. He lost to Eddie, lost to Edson. And, you know, the Holloway fight was the first time he got finished. But I feel like Poirier was the first man to truly make him quit. Like, uh, I thought I thought Pettis showed up to fight, actually. But I just felt like Poirier was too much. Man, the scrambles in that fight, the back and forth. It was truly like a WEC classic out yeah. there. And, I mean, we could have bought out the blue cage and all that. But, uh you know, I think Pettis, Pettis can still win fights, certain fights. You know, I lightweight. I just don't think he'll ever be on that uh, upper echelon. But uh, Poirier is one, one, one away from a title shot, man. He really is. And now, you know, he's going to fight the winner of Eddie Alvarez versus Justin Gaethje. He called his shot. You know they're going to give it to him, man. I mean, is Dustin Poirier the most exciting fighter in modern-day UFC? I mean, just this guy's history, man, even dating back to the WEC. But was in the WEC when he's 20 years old, you know what I'm saying? All of his fights are exciting. I know it gets hairy, you know, betting-wise on him. It's always going to get hairy just the way he fights. But, I mean, just the long, you know, amount of work this guy's put in. 14-4 and four in the UFC. When he left featherweight, most wins at featherweight, most finishes at featherweight. And he's top top 10 in two different divisions, man. I mean, the guy's had a great career, and it can only get better. And, you know, after, if he's able to get a win over Justin Gage or Eddie Alvarez, he'll be top five in two divisions. Yeah, so, I mean... He, you know, in the past, you know, he's always choked up in these main events. And, you know, it's been unfortunate. But the fact that he finally got one under him, hey. You know, people say history repeats itself. But I feel like a lot of these fighters learn from their mistakes and they can come back better. For example, we always, you know, people always used to say Bisbing can't win the, the big fight. And then he goes out there, beats Anderson Silva, beats Luke Rockle, beats Dan Hendo in the rematch. And with Poirier, you know, people said he can't win main events. Well, last night he won a main event. Yeah, man. You got to pick spots in this game. And uh, it was just a perfect spot for Poye, you know, um, betting-wise that night, man. It was just uh, wrong picks, really. I mean, sometimes it happens. You can't win them all, and, uh, but Poye was a solid pick. Yeah, you know, we're not even going to make excuses for picking against Tatiana and Sage. You know, they did their things yeah. and, and their opponents, you know. It was when what it was. When you lose, you lose. You know what I'm saying? It's You'll never hear an yeah. excuse from us, but we let's give some shine to Poye, man, because, I mean... How many ounces of blood has this guy given us for entertainment? You know, how much has he shed from his soul for us to be able to watch the unbelievable fights he puts on every single time? And I remember, you know, back in the WC, obviously. But what about that UFC debut versus Josh Crispy, where Crispy was supposed to fight Aldo, and Aldo pulls out, which he is known for. And then Dustin Poirier gets the call up on short notice. He's a plus 200 underdog. He goes out there and absolutely destroys the former number one contender. Yeah, man. I mean, this guy's, like I said, long amount of time putting in work. And, I mean, it's finally time to reward him. We know what happened in that Alvarez fight we we saw what happened he was Alvarez was getting pieced up and you know I think Eddie was just in survival mode the way that fight ended I just think he wasn't thinking he was out on his feet but now we have unfinished business with him yeah and you know as far as I'm concerned he's coming off two wins over two former champions you know because we both know that he beat Eddie but look they'll get a chance to run it back if Eddie gets past Gaethje which is going to be a very tough fight and I cannot wait to see uh, Dustin Poirier fight again and 
after that, I can't wait to see him fight again. You know what I'm saying? Because Poirier is always involved in exciting fights, and I wish the best for Anthony Pettis. You know, it is sad when you see your favorite fighters who, you know, Anthony showed up to fight last night. He did show up to fight, but here's what I'm trying to say, Shaq, is that you know, back in the day, it used to be like, well, the only people to beat Pettis were you know a close split decision to Bart Palshevsky and you know Clay Guida laid on him. It was always like you know you can never finish this guy, but but you can you can avoid the fight and beat him. But now we're at a point where you know not only did Holloway finish him, but We've never seen Pettis tap out, let alone tap out from a submission that wasn't locked in. And I, I know he had a hurt ribs. We don't know the exact diagnosis as of now, but look, he was hurting there and things happened. But I know a prime Pettis would have toughed that out. Oh, of course. I mean, a lot of guys would have toughed that out. But man, with all that blood spilling, man, he's cut up open bad, getting beat on the feet. Then he's... You know, he's given all in his triangle attempts, and, you know, Poirier was just going to get out of all of them. Yeah, and Pettis had enough, and, you know, I, I hope they, you know, give Pettis some cupcakes. Let him get his confidence back. Let him have some nice performances to, to close his career out. And yeah. for Poirier, you know, work your way up to that title shot. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, like I said, I thought Pettis showed up. I felt like the early triangle attempts were fucking disgusting. I thought they were like, Jesus, like, that's prime Pettis, the way he was getting those legs up. Like, you remember how he subbed... Uh, Mike Campbell and uh, Shane Roller and all that. So I was like, man. But uh, Poye got through it, man. He really did. And the co-main event, look, Matt Brown on his retirement fight, allegedly. You know, <laughs> he wouldn't, man, I just wish he went out there and had a nice speech like Chris Lytle did. Don't get me wrong, I enjoyed the speech. But, you know, put a storybook ending to it. But yeah, now he's kind of leaving the the options open, the door open. I'm kind of like, Matt, listen, man, you went out on the perfect note. And look, I'm not one to tell someone when to, to retire. It's his career. It's his choice. You know, it's it's up to him, his family, and his friends. But as a hardcore fan of Matt Brown, someone who, you know, I consider him one of my favorite fighters, I don't feel like we need to see him fight anymore. I feel like he's proven everything he needs to prove. You know, that fight with Robbie Lawler, he was inches away from, you know, from if he would have won that fight, he would have been the number one contender. He reached top five status in the UFC welterweight division. He's given us some of the best fights we've ever seen, starting from that Pete Cell fight where he absolutely destroyed him. Up until last night with Diego Sanchez, that elbow was a, a highlight reel knockout. And, you know, my hat's off to Matt Brown. I mean, great career. Matt Brown is one of the best to ever do it, man. His career, I mean, the Mike Swick fight, the Eric Silva fight, the Jordan Mean fight. The Wonder Boy the fight. The Wonder Boy fight. Douglas Lima fight. The Robbie fight. Lawler fight. The Douglas Lima fight. I mean, you got so many fights with this guy. And, uh, I mean, he had a great career. You know, I wish you would hang him up. I, I think uh, if he, you know, wants another title run, I just don't think that's going to happen. But I still think he can, uh, you know, have some fun fights um, with certain matchups, you know. The issue is he doesn't want fun exactly, fights. Exactly. He says, he if I'm not going for the title, I'm not going to be here. And, you know, that's unfortunate. But uh, hopefully, you know, he just hangs him up. I mean, the guy's done it all, so. Uh, it was yeah. great to see Matt Brown get that high, that real and victory. And much respect to Diego, too. And how about my boy Rafael Asunza, man? I oh, mean, we were just going to get into that. Like, man, I mean. He goes out there, you know, the knock on him is always, you know, he coasts to decision wins or win split decisions. But, man, he finally – and Lopez is a game guy, man. I mean, Lopez has had no easy fights in the UFC. I mean, debut against Hani, next fight against uh, uh, Mitch Gagnon. All all of his guys, that they were all uh, top 15 at one point. Mitch Gagnon, Johnny Eduardo, and uh, his day, and Hani Aya. So, I mean, Lopez is no slouch. And Rafael actually put him away, man. And that, uh, that ending combo is disgusting. Not only did he put him away, he broke him down with leg kicks, almost like a prime Jose Aldo out there. I was like, oh, man, I guarantee you uh, Matthew's not walking on his own today. Yeah, I mean, and Rafael, since I was beating seven guys in the top 15, he's beating half of the top 15, man. Who else has done that? Yeah, I mean, for everyone, anyone that missed what Shaq just said, Rafael <laughs> has beaten seven guys in the top 15 of the UFC bantamweight division, and I think he's earned a big fight. Yeah, man, I, I mean, honestly, you have to reward the guy. When you look at that resume, man, wins over TJ, I mean, Sterling, Caraway, Pedro, Pedro Munoz, I mean, Marlon. Uh, Johnny Eduardo, Marlon Moraes. I mean, the guy is a top five bantamweight, hands down. And speaking of Marlon Moraes, man, you know, I actually agree with the decision. Oh, yeah. I, I thought he beat Dotson last night. I thought night. he straight up beat Dotson at least two rounds of one. But to be honest, I thought he won every round, bro. To be honest, I, I felt like, you know, Dotson, you know, uh, dropped him in the first round. But other than that, Marlon won the whole round. Yeah, look. Marlon did his thing. He slowed him down with the with the big kicks, and man, that kick the is kick, serious. That kick is that kick's a deadly right kick. <laughs> and I can't wait to see Marlon now that he's feeling comfortable inside the octagon. We know how this shit goes, man. They gotta get their footing pay down your and pay your dues. Pay your dues first. like he did against Rafael Sun and mm-hmm. now he's ready for another big fight. He, he wants uh, Jimmy Rivera, man. Uh, how do you think that fight's gonna go down? Oh man, 
uh, you know, first round Jimmy is a serious thing. Yeah, that's all Jimmy, I gotta say. Jimmy Rivera is the number one contender. Just put it that way. If Marlon can get past that first round, then you know, it gets interesting. It would get very interesting. And you know, another performer last night that really came out and put it all on the line was Clay Guida. I mean, not, not you know, we thought it was going to be one of those situations where you know, Lozon comes out hard, Guida weathers the storm and grinds him out in the last two, but it was Guida that put Lozon away in the first round. Yeah, man. Um, Guida look. Guida's been looking good lately, man. I mean, it seems like he's rejuvenated a little bit at a Team Alpha Male. And, uh, you know, I feel like Lozon has taken a lot of damage in his career. A lot of a lot of shots, a lot of bloodshed. And I think maybe finally it was just enough. Yeah, that's what I think as well. So much respect to Guida on that incredible incredible performance. And Joe Lozon, you know, true, uh, true badass of the sport. Yeah, man. So we got to hit up Colby Covington. Colby Covington, you're on half the battle with Dan and Shaq. How's it going, man? It's all good, man. Just out here living the dream, man. So, Colby, you're coming off 30-25 in Don Young Kim, and then you 30-26 Damian Maya. What does Colby Covington have to do to get a title shot? Uh, you know, I think I did what I needed to do to get a title shot. You know, we got the same resume. Donald Woodley can say whatever he want. You know, we beat the same guys. We got the same resume. Our last opponent is the same opponent, you know, so... You know, there's not much else I need to do. Is I can't be more dominant than I've been. You know, I haven't been touched in my career. And Tyler Woodley's not going to be the first one to do that. What's it going to take for him to take the fight with you? Uh, you know, it's going to have to take the UFC and Dana White. I'm going to know that either way, you're going to get paid regardless. You know, you're going to get your pay-per-view you money. You're not a pay-per-view draw. So, you know, you're not going to get the UFC fight. So, you know, I'm the next contender in line. You know, the UFC is going to have to make you mad up. But... You know, he's probably going to be a diva and do what he's trying to do with uh, Damian and Maya. You know, hey, okay, you got to fight me on four weeks notice. If you want to do that with me, whatever, you know, I'll fight him on a week's notice. Yeah, Colby, uh, nice to meet you, man. But, uh, you know, Tyron, uh, he likes to, you know, act like you're not on his level and that because you got punched yeah. by Damian Maya. But the funny thing is, you know, I, I, re I recall him getting outstruck by Jake Shields back in the day. Um, I mean, uh, what do you think about that? Uh, yeah, I think it's hilarious. You know, he's just acting safer than he already is, you know. I'm in his head, you know. Deep down inside, he knows what I need to him at the gym. So, you know, he can put on this act and try and say these things, but, you know, he's saying a bunch of bullshit, to be honest. You know, you saw Jake Shields, you know, the worst striker in MMA, I'm striking. Roy McDonald, Nate Marquardt. You know, David Meyer was going to solve that hands on him, too. So, you know, he's not as God like he thinks he is. So, we know T. Wood... He's the kind of guy he likes to circle up against the fence and land that big right hand. I mean, what's the key to, you know, getting around that? Because everyone else, they've been punked out before the fight even began. Uh, the key to getting around that is just putting the pressure on him right away. You know, you can't let him get into his type of fight. His type of fight is, oh, let's back up to the cage, back up. I got going on the fight, trying to, trying, uh, you know, kind of dope someone in. Then, boom, it's going with the right hand. That doesn't work against me. I know his weaknesses. I know his fight style. So, you know, that's the biggest thing that he doesn't want to fight me. He knows that his style doesn't work against a guy like me. So, you know, I'm going to put the pressure on breaking. You know, on paper, um, you guys are both on the same level of wrestling on paper. You know, you were the Pac-10 champion. I think he was the uh, Big 12 champion. But between you guys, who's the better wrestler here? I don't think he's ever Big 12 champion. He couldn't beat the guy that was going to McDonald's every weekend, Johnny Hendricks. So, you know, I don't think, I don't think he ever got those. I lose the title, but, you know, my level of wrestling is completely different than his. You know, he, he may have credentials-wise, but wrestling-wise, he wrestled, you know, probably 100 live goals in the American Top Team, and he didn't win one of those goals. So, it's a different, it's just a different level of wrestling and a different style of wrestling. So, man, your last fight with Damian Maya, it really seemed like you were having so much fun out there. And it's not often that people have fun going to Brazil when everyone's screaming, you're going to die. And not only that, you're taking on the number one contender at the time on planet Earth. And, I mean, dude, we, we know what happened. You 30-26 the guy. Was that the most fun you've ever had inside the octagon? Yeah, definitely. I had a great time, man. This is what I live for, man. I've been training for this since I was a little kid, you know, since I was six years old. So, you know, I'm just having so much fun. I'm just getting warmed up, man. I'm, I'm laughing and smiling and having fun. Honestly, this is you haven't even seen the best Colby Covington yet. So I'm just laughing at all the people, the doubters, all the people, you know, like Tyrone Woodley. Those, those are smiles for those guys because, you know, we're just getting warmed up right now. And, you know, it's funny because you uh... – like I said, how Tyron uh, acts like you're not on his level. But to be honest, I mean, right now, you are the most talked, guy, talked about guy in the division. Everyone's talking about you all day, every day. And it's more than Tyron Woodley. I mean, right now, you have the more hype. Uh, 
I just don't understand why he's not taking this fight. I mean, let's be honest. Let's 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 look at the facts. Let's look at the numbers. You know, there's a reason he's not taking the fight. He doesn't want to say my name. I mean, honestly, he could tell the fans or the the media and the world that oh, he, I'm not going to fight him. He's telling him he got outshot by David, or he could tell him the real truth why he doesn't want want to fight me because I'm his worst nightmare and his worst matchup. He's not going to beat me, and he knows that deep down inside. So he's trying to weasel his way into the super fight that he's never going to get. I'm the next contender in line, man. He already fought Wonder Boy twice. He already fought all of the guys. So a lot of people criticize you in that first round of the Maya fight because he landed a couple punches. But, you know, for people that know what they're watching, we kind of know that, you know, you were having fun out there. And if it was against a different opponent, like if you fought Wonder Boy or even T-Wood, that you would have a different approach. So how do you respond to the criticism? Haters going to hate, man. I just got to laugh at them. These are the same guys that said, oh, you'll never make it to UFC. Oh, you'll never be ranked. You never get top 10. Look at me now, motherfucker. I'm the best welterweight in the fucking world. They can say whatever they want to say. I, I'm a man of my word. I, I said I was going to go for it. I was going to put Damian Maia in the most exciting fight of his life. Oh, he caught one little tiny punch that gave me a little tiny cut. They got a little tiny bit of blood. That's all he did to fight. He got beat up. He got battered. He got finished at the end. So, you know, I'm next in line, but best welterweight in the world. Tyron Woodley needs to stop hiding. When you get this chance to fight Tyron Woodley, if he accepts the fight, are you planning to put him on his back right away? Are you trying to strike with the guy? I mean, you said the pressure, but what would be the plan there? Uh, for every fight, there's a different game plan. I'm not going to give away my game plan for a guy like that because he's next, man. We're, you know, we're going to fight next. Whatever he wants to duck me, I'm next in line. I'm the next guy to the fight. But I will tell you, there's a different game plan for every fighter at this weight class. And I have the tools. I am the most well-rounded fighter in the world. If I fight Wonder Boy... I'm going to fight him a certain way. If I fight Damian Maia, I'm going to fight him a certain way. And Tyro Woodley's next, and I will fight him a certain way, but you just have to wait and tune in. But I guarantee my hand will be getting raised. You know, okay, so last night we had Dustin Poirier, you know, your teammate, ATT, and then, you know, he fought Pettis, who was Rufus Sport. And, you know, uh, there was a, a time where uh, Tyron said that uh, Pettis had the uh, camp advantage going into the fight. Now, I know he, he wants to be ATT, and but he's really Team Rufus Sport. So, like, what is the real extent of his relationship with ATT? Yeah, he's not at t You know, the real ATT guys that are in the heart of ATT, that are there every day in Coconut Creek, Florida, training year-round, you know, he comes maybe once a year. And the only reason he came once a year is because he's trying to suck up to the to the gym owner and my manager, Dan Lambert. So he's trying to, to be a piss-ass. That's what Tyron would do is he's an off-teacher. I'm over here ass-kicking. Tyron Woodley's an ass-kicker. So, Colby, look, a lot of people just like to, you know, criticize you because you talk a little shit, which is actually very important if you want to get your name out there. But what they don't know is you're actually the kind of guy that you live at the gym. What's it like, you know, basically training 12 hours every single day and being that focused on your goal? Oh, I'm, I'm passionate about what I do, man. I set out for this goal since I was six years old. And when I set out for this goal, I set out to be the greatest of all time. So, you know, this is this is fun to me. You know, 12 hours in the gym, I love this shit. I eat this, I breathe it. You know, I don't got no distractions. There's no wife, there's no kids, there's no girlfriend. I'm all in on this. So, you know, I don't do anything else but MMA, UFC, and just think about fucking my next fight and how I can get better each and every day. So, you know, I'm living this right now. I am the best welterweight in the world. And now, you know, of course you were uh, saying, you know, Brazil's a dump and, you know, it was, it was hilarious to me. And, you know, some people took it the wrong way. But um, how was it when you got back to ATT or if you even been back yet? But uh, I'm sure the Brazilians at the gym know that you were just uh, trying to hype the fight. Yeah, because, like, dude, I, let me interject here because even at the post-fight press conference, Pedro Munoz knew exactly what you were doing. But then there were other people that were kind of taking offense to it. Uh, I haven't been back to ATT yet. You know, I've been on the road. I was doing uh, I was doing some filming for uh, Pro Wrestling Angle and Impact. We're on the show with my manager, Dan Lambert, and a couple of ATT guys. So I, I was in Canada for a week and a half, and then I was in Oregon for a little bit, and then I'm heading to Australia tomorrow for the UFC in Australia. So I haven't been back to ATT, but, you know, I don't really care, man. I'm, I, you think I care about if I'm hurting someone's feelings? I'm not a sensitive guy. I don't have emotions. So I'm detached from it. I'm doing what's best for me and my career. I, I'm not worried about someone else's career. And, man, what do you think about your teammate Dustin Poirier's performance last night? Because he went out there, you got the biggest win of his career, and he dominated. He looked good, man. He, he's ready for a uh, title shot, man. They need to give him a big fight. You know, he needs to get that number one contendership fight. You know, the Gagey Alvarez winner and, you know, he, he's ready to go, man. He's hungry. He's in the best he's ever been. So, you know, he's an exciting fighter. 
when are you trying to make that return to the octagon? I mean, I know it's not necessarily in your hands. I know you have to have a willing dance partner. But if it were up to you, man, when are you trying to get back in there? Uh, I heard Tyrone Wilkie's asking for December 30th. So, you know, maybe that, that might end up happening with me and Tyrone December 30th in Vegas. So, you know, I'm ready to go whenever, man. I commit my whole, whole life to this. There's no partying for me. I live this. Like I told you, I'm, in the, I'm not only in the gym, but I live the lifestyle. And I live year-round, so, you know, I'm always ready to go on short notice. If he wants to go next week, we can go next week. If he wants to wait till December 30th, okay, I'll wait till December 30th for the big dollar. And I think what you're doing with the uh, pro wrestling thing is great. Um, are we going to consistently seeing you do these, th- these type of things? Um, if the timing works out, I would love to. You know, you might see me in an angle with uh, WWE or maybe even go over to Japan. But, you know, it just depends on you know, with the timing, because, you know, I'm worried about getting the welterweight world title right now. That's my sole focus in pro wrestling's uh, second back seat to that right now. Well, Kobe, we want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us right here, right now on Half the Battle. It's been a pleasure, man. The fans can follow you at Colby Cove MMA. Colby, any message for the fans before we go? I'm the best welterweight in the world. Marlon Vera, you're on Half the Battle with Dan and Shaq. How's it going, man? All good, bro. All good. Getting some rest. I'm getting ready for the second Monday, Monday tomorrow. Yes, sir. So, How man, are you? I'm doing amazing. Did you see uh, Dustin Poirier and Anthony Pettis throw down last night? Yeah, that was a badass fight. I knew it probably were, 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 were taking the win since he's been great lately, and that was a great show last night. Good banter with fights, and I'm, I'm, I'm just excited. The fights are getting better, and I'm there with the time. Oh, yeah. Speaking of the Bantamweight fights, man, what did you think about Rafael Asuncao and Marlon Moraes getting the wins? Well, Rafael, uh, he, did, he did great. You know, um, Matt Lopez is a great wrestler. We turned before. He's a nice guy. Good to get to. But he has put pressure. I, I, I don't know. I think Matthew freaks a little bit. With a heavy hitter like that, you can not stay in the fence. Just waiting for a punch, you know. If a punch land, you will go down for sure. And probably, oh, the the the, the way got put an issue here, make the way so probably he got a hard time. You never know. It's hard to judge, but it was a good it, it was a good win for Adam Sal, and it was a good opportunity for Matthew. And then Marlon Moraes, that was a close fight, but but he beat Dawson. Dawson, Dawson, he he, he decided, you know, move a lot. He, he's not a guy who runs a lot. He moves a lot, but he kind of full-step fighter. Um, but I think Marlon just throw more and put pressure. I mean, he loves the fight the same way he loves the Lineker. He thinks, I think he's thinking he's doing enough to win, and then he just let on the judges' hands. You know, like just doing a lot trying to win. He just kind of stuck when he thinks he wins the fight and then he just moves. And then he said. Super talented fighter. I just think he's too small for the division. Yeah, that's a good point, man. And you brought up Lineker, so I got to ask you, man. You just went three hard rounds with the hardest hitter in your division. You know, when other people take those shots, they either get knocked out or they stop fighting for you. You took the shots like a champ. You came back. You won the third round. So, I mean, what did you take away from that that performance, man? I mean, you got to see what you were all about against a top five guy. Well, you know, I always tell this to you or to anybody I talk in my interviews. Like, I'm, I'm always turning. Like, if I, I'm, I'm not turning the last two weeks because my foot wasn't clear. I'm clear to train now, so I'm, I'm back on the, on the miss. But I'm a guy that I'm winning 151 this morning. So that means I'm keeping my diet clean. I, I, I'm hoping to fight again. I'm not getting crazy. Like, oh, I need to fight anytime. Like, I will take my time, but when I say I will take my time, it, it not, it's not more than a month So for us for a fight. Or if, they call me, if they call me early, that's good, but I'm just always trying to be ready and healthy to, to go in there. The only reason I don't step on those fights that people get injured in the last week is because my foot wasn't clear. Now I'm clear. Now I want to train to see what happens. If, if I'm good, I'm good. And I will start asking for a fight, but my fight... It was. I think it was a pretty close fight. Um, I think I lost that fight because I figured it out a couple of things kind of late. And also, normally Lineker come forward all the time. I was ready for counter. But he was smart. He got a lot of experience and 
he's a bad motherfucker for a reason, and he kind of played the game of staying the outside and see and, and try to fi- figure me out. But he wasn't able to figure out my attack. But I ah uh, I find out lately, and I was trying to put him out. Uh, I should make more numbers because he lands and I go forward. I land and he and he, and he make and, and, and he make a face like he was worried. So. I, I was really upset I lost the fight and I, I couldn't go up in the rankings. But at the same time, I, I, I put my names on notice to all the guys down there. Like, I, I know that fight. A lot of guys I know. I don't give a fuck. I would say yes all the time. I fought anybody. Because I know I got the skills for fighting anybody. But I want to be losing in class decisions. Lose is a lose. I don't care if you get knocked down or you lose in a super close decision. It's the same. You lost. What I want is to say winning again and... I, w- I will work my ass even harder than before and keep myself keep myself the same and just try to win fights now. Yeah, Marlon, uh, I think you pretty much hit it on the head, man. I think uh, it was a case of getting started too late, but it was so interesting because Lineker has, you know, a reputation of, you know, busting guys up early and still breaking them late. But what was going through your mind when he was actually the guy on the ropes in that third round? And, I mean, it looked like he wanted his way out of the fight. Well, I, I, I was losing his face. He was, he, he was, he, he was all broke. He was like, he was worried. He was scared. He, 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 he was needing to that belt to win, and that that's crazy because I was just feeling like you're gonna give me four more rounds and I will bust this guy up. Like if you give me probably a minute, I will knock him out. But I, I can be a dumbass and talk like that because that won't happen. I, I should do earlier, but I think the first round. It was even like we we just checked each other. Then the second round, he land, I land. I when I kick, he kicked my leg. I fall down in the ground. So he got thirty seconds of of, of ground and pound. That he, he wasn't like he was destroying me. He, he landed a couple of shots, but I was throwing with elbows and I was trying to do something. And then the third round, I walk him down completely. Uh, in my mind, that fight would be a draw. Like no problem, a draw. Like. Because the first round was even. Second round, he got 30 seconds on top of me. And then the, and then the third round, that, that, that was a race. He was running for his life. And I, and I was like chasing him. Like I was like, t- I was telling him to come on. And that's the first time that guy rejects a fight. And that just let me know a lot about me. And that, that just motivated me to, to understand where I am right now. And, and just keep going forward from there. Yeah, man, it was crazy because, uh, like we said, it looked like Lineker, you know, he was fading in that fight. And if you had two more rounds, you probably could have, you know, gotten a decision there. But, uh, I mean, the fact that you did that against, you know, a top five Bantamweight, I mean, shows that you can stack up with the best. I mean, I know you will fight anybody, but is there anyone in particular? Well, right now, uh, I try to slow down myself a little bit. I, I, I like to learn how to lead like 100 miles uh a day, but I, I just want to wait and let, let my coach figure it out and my manager what what to be next. And if they, if, if, they, if they tell me, if they make me a question, they know I will say yes. So now, like, I don't have a name in specific, you know. Like, I just, I just want to fight and go back in charge again. I'm still as hungry as I was before. I'm still motivated. I just don't want to rush myself. Like, I'm done. I, I, I don't have to boss my career because I just want to do crazy things. You know, sometimes you gotta do the right thing and be crazy lately in your career. No, not at the beginning. I gotta prove myself now. I gotta go up again. Even if it was a close fight, a lot is a lot. And I don't like that shit. So, uh, I gotta work hard. And, uh, there's a couple more fights in, in December. So, if somebody's hurt, if they don't find an opening for somebody, I'll probably jump in there. Yeah, they actually just booked uh, Rob Font versus Tomas Almeida. You hear that? Yeah, I, I saw that. I'm always watching who's fighting, and, and that's a good fight. I, I, I think I think that, that that will be a really good fight. And he, uh, but, uh, talking about Rob Font, Pedro Muniz was really good when he get that choke, but I think it was a little bit of uh, kind of bad decision from Font. Like, if Pedro Muniz hurt you, you don't shoot for a double. Like that, that's the worst thing you can do, and he did it. But he, he, he was a good prop, props for Munoz. He he got a choke. So I don't know who's available right now. Um, 
Normally, it's going to get hurt, but that, that, that's like a title fight in elimination. So, this fight is like probably hard to get. But there's a couple more coming up in December, and I'm sure there's a bunch of needing to fight. Yeah, and like you said, man, you're still young. You're only 24 years old. And I got to ask you, though, a lot of people consider John Lineker to be the hardest hitter in your weight class. I mean, is he the hardest hitter you've ever faced? Well, Brad Tinker is pretty fast and he's way more technical. But obviously, Lineker is just like a, he throws bombs. But he throws so hard that the, the problem is like people get too scared. Like, in my mind, I just think like what's the worst that can happen? Somebody turn my lights out? That's not a big deal. We're fired. We gotta, we, we gotta have it in our mind that that can happen someday. So I wasn't scared of getting knocked out. That's why I was able to perform. But I saw people that they get hit in the stomach and then like, they shake the bed. I'm like, you get hit all the time in the fire. Like, why do you shake the bed when you're fighting? That's why people get scared with Gagarin too because, oh, he hit hard. Yeah, but everybody hit hard, trust me. Who, who, who's that? Who's like probably the look? Augusto Mendes. He's probably the best jiu jitsu guy in the division. That guy come on fucking swing hard. And you know what? He's not scared. And he's not doing bad in the UFC for being a jiu jitsu guy. He's good. But people just get scared. And they need to hit hard. Don't get me wrong. Like my ribs were sore the next day. But we are sore every day of training. So I just think like when people get too scared about something, they get hit. They set the bed and they just close the eyes and get knocked down. Or they start swinging against Lineker and they get, they get knocked down because they do the wrong thing. He's hard. He is he really hard. But I also kick really hard too. So you have to be well prepared and trust yourself. Like if you, take, if you take a fight, you must be ready. Or you, you must be needing the money for it. But, but if you need the money, you shouldn't set the bed. If you prepare, you shouldn't set the bed. Sometimes people just take the fight because they like the media and they like to be interim fighters. I'm a real fighter. I prepare myself because I want to be a world champion someday. So that's my thoughts on on that linear power. Yeah, he is really hard. I'm pretty sure if he caught me going in, he probably put me out. But I was trusting in me. I was I was ready to that fight, and I was actually thinking of putting him out. Like I was I was needing it. Thinking of knocking him out the whole time. I was on elbows, I was on knees. And I, I, I should only make like, more points and I probably get the win. So, Marlon, I mean, you were throwing some big kicks, some big knees. Were you surprised at how solid his chin is, man? Because he ate a bunch of those shots and I was like, oh my God, like, how is he still standing? I I knew that he had a pretty good chin. He's a guy that has a. Like, I was very respect, respectful, but he got a big head. Like, that's a big guy. Like, he's, he's a little guy, size-wise, but he's wide. Like, he doesn't, he doesn't like typical guys that are really buff upstairs, and then his legs are really skinny. This guy is like, he's like, he's like one-dimensional. He like, big chest, big legs, big arms. He got a fucking huge neck. And, and I, I read an uh, article that was saying about why Roy Nelson, he never gets knocked down. Well, after Michael Hunt, but before that, it's because the muscles from the neck, they're pretty strong. And Lineker got a pretty big neck. Like, that guy got a neck. And I was I was throwing. Like, I was trying to break his jaw again. But I got to give him props to him. He, he, he's a tough guy. And I, I always say this. These guys bring big balls. Like, this guy, he can be losing the whole fight. He keep throwing hard, so it was a good experience for me. It will help me. It will, it will, this will help me in my future, and it only will get me better. But I will give him props. I I was saying I will I I I will beat him. I think I think I I do I do my best. I fight hard, but I don't get it. But I I I would say I out. The guy can take it. I I throw a couple big jabs to his face. I normally put people out with those jabs. Like, I told my jab and people fall down. The guy was, like, keeping bringing forward, but I just, I just show what I got. I show my tools. Like, normally, when you're losing, he always keep going forward. Last round, he was running away surviving. Like, he knew it. He knew it. He was almost out. He knew it. Yeah, man. And, uh, 
You know, uh, I heard you uh, say earlier that, you know, you guys are training very hard. And I, you know, I follow you on Instagram and I see you, uh, you know, doing some CBD oil sponsorships. Uh, is that, does that help your uh, recovery after training? Yeah, that actually really helped. Like, I, I, I bought my food. The doctor said it was broken because the MRI showed, like, a lot of weird things. But God, God bless and I got nothing. It was just, like, a big bruise in the bone. But... I'm I'm not using much ice. I'm I'm only taking CBD in the morning at the night, and I think it really helps. Like I understand what this is banned because this is like these products are probably cheaper than the medicine you buy at the pharmacy, and obviously the big companies want to hide the natural things and they want to put all this chemical bullshit on your system. That it's the same thing, like. Yeah, I could take I, I could be taking I do perform every day. But that thing will hurt me at the end of the day. If I take C V D they won't hurt me never. So but I'm glad it to be legal in the year. Because this don't get you high, this don't make you a better fire, this is nothing on you but just inflammation and help you to sleep and relax, like this thing is it, 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 it's like it's like turmeric. It's like ginger. It, it helps you for, for information and things like that. So I try to be as help I, I can be, and I'm glad I'm working with this company. Yeah, and Chito, man, every single fight, you make such big improvements. And I know we've talked about this every single time that we speak, but, you know, the first time I saw you fight, you know, versus Psycho Beltran versus Roman Salazar, compared to now, you're going out there knocking out Brad Pickett, submitting Brian Kelleher, and having a three-round great fight with John Lineker. So, I mean, man, what's a, what's the, the ceiling for Marlon Chito Vera, man? Because it seems like, you know, within the next half year, you will be in the top 15. Well, I, I always say like, I cannot be selfish. I got, I got people on my back. Like I, 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 I bring my work ethic, but that's not enough. You need to have like professionals on your back. So why I'm improving, why I'm, why I'm showing different things is because Colin Oyama. This guy, like, is I'm truly happy and blessed to be working with him. He's, he's just not a good coach. He's a nice person. Like, if I need something or somebody something, he will help you. If you want extra work, he helps you. He's not the guy that put the money first. He's the guy that put his heart first and he tried to help you. So I'm just like I'm just feeling like all the time I'm in the gym, he showed me something that helped me. He's he's, he's improving my basics. He's improving my you know my my weird kicks and my things that I throw for angles. Like he's always I'm gonna hey you know what you gotta mix your wrestling. We got Alex Bird. He just signed with the UFC. He's my he's like my wrestling coach. I used to came with our okay, wrestling. Now my wrestling is getting better. Then we turn with him Planet Jiu Jitsu. We have great uh, staff in there. They got really good techniques and the team is just is just getting better. We have a bunch of fighters from South America. We have one from Brazil. And the team is doing great. Like you know, Yama is is having a uh, good fighters taking place in the UFC, good fighters upcomers that they're going to the UFC soon and Everything, everything that you see developed in the father is because who they have in the back. I know the father is the one who do the job. The father is the one who put the face to fight. But without the preparation and the tools that your coaches gave you, you won't make it so far. So I believe in that. That's why I, I'm a family man in the home. And I took my gym as my family too. Yeah, man, I feel like uh, Colin Oyama doesn't get enough credit. I mean, he's got you, he's got Alex Perez, he's got uh, Carla Esparza, Brent Primus, I mean, Humberto, Humberto ben- Bendene. I mean, the guy produces uh, UFC fighters, Diego Rivas. And, uh, you know, I feel like, uh, like you know, your prior, your prior training situation, I mean, like, is it just complete night and day difference that you're training in the States now? Or do you feel like you would have always been at this level uh, regardless of where you were training at? Well, it, it, the difference are crazy. When I was in Ecuador, it was really like, it was just like, let's do something today. It was hitting me two times a day because there was nobody to work. And then my training partners, they were my really good friends. They are my really good friends, but they, was, they wasn't prepared for helping. They, they were just people that were trying to help me because they loved me. And we were trying hard, but there's a point that you can win a, you can win one or two like that, but then you won't make it far like that. And then when I move out here, I, 
I got a good fighting coaches. I got a fucking great conditioning coach that is Cody Bailey. Like you can see all my fights. I'm 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 not dying. And and I've been in a couple of wars lately, like Brad Pickett. That was a fucking fight. Then the Keller fight well, that was short that was that was that was that was short only a couple of minutes. But then the the Linker fight that was three rounds moving and interchanging punches with that guy and my condition is good, like Garvin was talking shit that you cannot uh, condition your shin. All you can. The, the better is your cardio, the more you are prepared, the better is your diet, you will take the punches better. And he he was talking about he didn't back up his words because he didn't recover from that punch. But Garvin doesn't recover from that kick. So I believe in that. I believe like the better you prepare, the better you can take the punch. And the better you can take the risk. So, Marlon, you mentioned how, look, your technique has been improving leaps and bounds since you've been training in the States. But if you go back and you watch your fight with Henry Brionis on Tough, look, you've always had the fight in you. You've always been an aggressive guy. You always come to fight. So let me ask you this, man. I mean, is this a mentality that you've had your entire life or is this something you've had to develop along the way? Because what I'm trying to say is that you've always been a true fighter. It's just that now the technique's improving. Well, I'm I'm from Ecuador. My dad is 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 is, is pretty wild. Like in just the environment I, I grew up. Like my grandpa, he was always taking me to the to the to the roster fight. Uh, my dad, you know, born in a, in, a, in a farm. Like get up and gra- grab the cows and do some men work. And nobody was pushing me. That I used to like those things. Like I used to wake up at like, four in the morning, milk the cows do something with the employees, go back, grab a machete, cut something, and, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just how, how I grew up. My cousins, just for fun, make me, fun, make me fight in the street with the poor kids. They were paying kids to fight me. And it wasn't like they were pushing me. I was like, hey, hey, you should go and grab somebody to fight. So I, I, just, I just grew up, you know, living, living, living the wildlife, you know, my family, you know, I come from a good family, like, we're super, uh, like, we do everything together, me and my cousins, we're really tight, and it's just, like, the environment I grew up, like, my cousins, they never trained fighting, but they used to be, like, kind of respect when we went to play soccer, people would say, oh, those guys can fight, or those guys are tough, you know, and uh, it's just how I grew up, you know, my, 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 my mom's uh, brother, she's not, like, a lot of pit bulls, so... I think it's in bottom when I grew up, like, somebody in the family do something cool and crazy, you know. My dad let me shoot his gun when I was a kid. I don't know. Uh, I, 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 I feel like I grew up in a really cool family that we did really cool things, and that turned my fight, my fight inside. Like, I always liked to fight. Like, I used to fight all the time, but I didn't, I didn't know how to do it. And I got my ass kicked all the time in the school. But I was always picking fights, not because I was a bully, but it was because I, I liked the feeling of being in a fight. And, and then when I finally saw Pride and Jeff Jones, I was like, okay, I will be there someday. That was when I fought Pickett, it was crazy because I used to watch his fights in WEC. And that's why I know, I know so much about MMA because I, all, I always used to watch fights. Even before training, I always bought the DVDs and just watch it a week later, download the UFCs and watch it on my computer. I was all about fighting and be like kind of a coward because I was born over there and just be every weekend working with my dad in the farm, riding a horse, boot, you know, jeans and you know, probably that life. Maybe you do something probably it's not probably it's not tied to fighting, but it's close to fighting, you know. No, 100%. And man, I mean, you've come a long way from buying, you know, UFC and Pride DVDs because now, look, man, you're the face of Ecuador MMA. I mean, you're, uh, you got a, the Pepsi sponsorship. If we go to Ecuador right now, you're on the billboards, you're in the bus stops. What's a, you know, what kind of responsibility is that for you? And what kind of pressure does that put on you, you know, that now, like, you're the face of Ecuadorian MMA? Well, definitely there's no pressure in that because. Uh, I'm not a guy that I'm trying to, to fuck this up. I'm just a guy that I'm trying to build this up and just make it bigger. And it's obviously a motivation for me. And 
uh, I, I remember this from the Spider-Man movie when his uncle told Spider-Man, like, a big power requires a big responsibility. So I'm just trying to, to get better, not just as a pirate, but as a person. Like, just try to be kind and help people that need help because that's all about, like, it's all about only to be the best. But it's about to be the best outside. Like, try to help the most you can. Try to send your hand to the people who need it, and just, just be kind to people. And that's what really matters. And keep your, keep your same attitude all the, all the time. You know, that that's what people really like. Like, all these today bullshit. It's just, it's just fucking annoying. All these guys like win couple fights and then they turn into the complete dicks and those guys. Yeah, they're cool for the moment, but nobody will remember those guys because all the fans they have is the fake fans they get for being like that. Like, I always say this, you see somebody like Minotauro or GSP, they never did this before. They talk a little bit, yeah, they say they will win the fight, they say fuck you, but that's okay. But they never cross the line. Like, this new trash talk is, is all bullshit. And it's the media fault because they only promote the guys that say fuck you or do stupid things and I truly believe like look GSP come back won his fight and he's still being the same fucking guy super humble kind and he's going fight and win the fight and that's what that's what you need this is martial arts this is not not the street this is not who's the the the, the meanest guy and those things sometimes bother me and sometimes make me think like I should change my type of thing. I should start being like that. But my insight something like no, you just be you, and that's that, that's how you will, you will make it bigger. Yeah, and uh, you know it's funny that you mentioned that because it, you know that is that basically is how the game is going. You know the guy that uh, the guy that talks a lot is the guy that uh, generally gets what he wants, and you know like. You know, necessarily, I don't think it's a bad thing, but could you ever see yourself, you know, possibly getting into a back and forth with a guy just to hype a fight? Because then at the end of the day, everyone's going to end up tuning. And if you back up your words, then your your name value goes way up. Well, I, I definitely got a personality. I can, I can talk. And I always say I will finish the guy. I always, I always say something about the fight. I'm not a quiet guy. And I always say something about the fight. I can talk about the fight. I can get my personality and talk I can talk shit, but I just don't get the guy like like to to do it yet. But I just I just see so many fake people these days trying to pretend being somebody else, and that's the thing that is just not right. Because those guys, then they start losing fights, and then what? So I don't have my words. I say I won't respect the guy, I won't fight the guy, and I do it. I know I don't want my last one, but it 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 wasn't a bad fight. It it, it wasn't a close fight, but he could go. Anyone from the outside of the team. And then, I, I, I used to read, like, if I have the right opponent that I don't like, I would definitely talk. Because I'm not a quiet guy. I'm a guy that would speak my mind. Because I, 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 I'm not scared to get in trouble from say what I think. And I don't give me. I, 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 I don't give a fuck. I, I already did a lot of things in my life. I left my family. I literally left my, my son when he was a little boy. When he see me again, he didn't recognize me. But all, all what I did, he was, he was from the family. So if, if, if somebody is a guy that is down for anything, I really do a lot of things for, for them what I want. So. And I will keep doing it for, 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 for them, what I really want to be a champion someday and just be, a, just be the, the best fighter in my division and spread good energy, good energy to everybody. You know, uh, Marlon, I, I have a theory that, you know, the, the longer body frames, you know, in these divisions like yourself, like, for example, how in that third round you started finding out your range against uh, Lineker and, you know, picking him off at distance. But I've had a theory that the longer body frame in MMA is going to uh, end up taking over. Um, do you agree with that theory? And, I mean, I know you're training with Oyama, Coach Casey. Um, is, is uh, you know, using your range going to be uh, more of uh, your main uh, weapon? going forward? Yeah, definitely. It depends on the fight. You know, it, it depends on the matchup. Like, I can, I can use my range, but I'm, I'm also, I'm also like the knee a lot, so I can fight in close position. And then my jiu-jitsu is not, it, it's good, so I gotta start using it too. Like, 
to my parents. Sometimes I try to knock the guy out and then forget it and, you know, just take him down and take him apart. But definitely the, the, the long, the skinny guys, they're doing good these days. But sometimes it's not, it, 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 it's, it's not about your size. Like, I really don't believe your size. Like, I, I sometimes I think of up weight class. Just because it's weight class thing, it, it's killing people, it's bad for, for the sport. But uh, it's hard because there's, there's a guy that costs from close to 200 pounds in 145. So it's not, it's not, it's not fair. But I'm, I'm considering doing that in the future. Because that, what, what I really think is not the size. It's about your heart, your work. That's what people say. I really don't believe that it's a size. I really think about the size inside you, what your heart drive you forward to make things and because there's a guy there's Kelvin Gaffman that's a legal guy for 85 that guy is tough that guy is skilled and he goes and fight you saw Carl Carl he was doing great lately before Darren Till beat him but Darren Till they got a couple of lot of work too so I, I believe it. it's all about your preparation and your determination that would drive you forward but I, I'm not also like a big guy. I was weighing 151 today. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of answer weights two weeks after the fight, they don't weigh 151. Because a lot of them, that's what they weigh the fight week. So, Marlon, before I let you go, man, how's this commentating gig been going for you, man? Because I know you're a guy that knows a lot about the sport. You truly watch it. And I've seen you and Santiago Ponzinibbio. You're doing your thing, man. So how's that going? Uh, it's doing pretty well. Like I'm doing my homework. I'm 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 not just watching the fights. I'm trying to call the fighters that I know, or if I know the coach or I'm friends with somebody from the camp. I just make a couple of questions just for get some more info for the fans. Like oh, I talked to this guy and blah blah. But I'm doing my homework. I I, I really like the thing, and my goal is to do it like you know like like Paul Felder like doing the real UFC like inside the cage. Those that those things that I feel. I can do it pretty well, and, you know, it's all about work hard and understand like step by step, but I'm pointing my eyes to do that someday. Well, Marlon, we want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us right here, right now on Half the Battle. It's always a pleasure, my man. The fans can follow you at Chito Vera UFC. And Marlon, you have any message for the fans before we go? Yes, yes don't, don't, don't stop taking what you want, and no matter how that hard the road gets, there's always the light coming at the end if you really chase it and you work hard. Eric Anders, you're on half the battle with Dan and Shaq. How's it going, man? Man, I'm doing awesome, man. Just getting back in town from uh, from Miami, so um, ready to get the car unpacked and you know get to bed a little early tonight. Oh yeah, you have a good time down there. Yeah, my wife she uh she had a fitness competition down there, so I went down there to support her and. You know, her endeavors and the things that she does as much as she supports me. So, yeah, we had a great time. So, I assume you didn't see uh, Dustin Poirier versus Anthony Pettis then? Oh, I watched it. What'd you think, man? Uh, Dustin put it on him. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I put my money on Dustin. He was kind of making me nervous, you know, keep diving back into those triangles and, you know, not passing the guard and whatnot. But, you know, he's a vet. He knows what he's doing. So, you know, I'm glad he was able to get out with the them. So, man, they just recently switched up uh, opponents on you, man. You're supposed to fight John Phillips. He pulled out the fight. Now you're taking on the newcomer, Marcus Perez. I mean, obviously, I know you're motivated. I know you're excited. But what do you know about this guy you're fighting? Um, Man, I've I, I only watched a few of his fights. watched his last LFA fight and a few of his fights down there in Brazil. Uh, I think he's really talented. You know, moves a lot, moves good. Um. You know, has that flashy kind of, you know, you know, like to throw a lot of spinning attacks and, you know, seems like an athletic guy. He's got a bunch of submissions uh, from weird positions and whatnot. So I'm definitely excited about the matchup. I think it's a great matchup. And, uh, you know, I'm looking to go out there and get a W as always. Yeah, and, man, I mean, do you have, you know, I know you're a competitor and you, you're trying to knock this guy out, but is there any added incentive knowing that, you know, he's the former LFA middleweight champ, you're the former LFA middleweight champ. I mean, it's a battle of uh, LFA, LFA bragging rights. No, not really. You know, we're both in the UFC now and, you know, looking to have long, prosperous careers. So, uh, 
like I said, I'm just trying to go out there and get a W however I can get it. Um, finish is always the goal, but, you know, he's a tough guy. seems to have a solid chin. So, you know, we'll see how the fight goes. And, you know, in your debut, you go in there against Rafael Natal, who, you know, maybe a couple years before that was a top 15 guy, and you got the win in the first round. And I just watched that, man. It was a, it was a brutal uh, performance, man. You controlled the entire fight. And, you know, I saw you trying to call out Kelvin Gaslam. I mean, are, do you feel like you're ready for these top 15 guys right now? Yeah, I feel like I'm ready for anybody in the division, you know. Um, you know, I'm always chopping up a bit. Every time someone drops out, I'm always, you know, trying to throw my name in the hat. But, you know, uh, you know, I, I understand Calvin's, uh, you know, angle at it. You know, why fight the guy who's had one fight in the UFC when you can go fight the guy, uh, the former champ? So, um, but there's no doubt in my mind, Calvin and I just pass across one day sooner or later, so. Uh, if not in two weeks from now, you know, for a little bit later down the road. Hey, so who's your money on, man? Kelvin or Bisping? I know Bisping is coming off that brutal loss only a week ago, but man, the way GSP looked that night, this is a different matchup here. Um, I think Kelvin's gonna try and, you know, GSP will take him down, choke him out, but you know, I think that uh, I think Bisping's gonna walk away with this W. And you know, uh the fight before your UFC debut, you went five rounds. And uh, how do you see this fight going on? Do you think it's going to go the distance, or are you uh, expecting to come out here and uh, control the guy and put him away? Uh, we both like to control the fight. If you watch all this fight, you know, he likes, likes to put a lot of pressure on people, back him up against Cage, uh, as do I. So, you know, we definitely want to see who Cage first. I definitely am very, always very confident in my uh, preparation and skill and, and coaching and whatnot. So, I'm always aiming to go out there and get a victory. You know, he throws a lot of wide shots. My shots come straight down the line. So, you know, I'm looking to beat him to the punch, so to speak. You know what's interesting, man? This is the second American that he's fought in his professional career, and this is the second Brazilian that you fought in your professional career. Just a little tidbit there. Yeah, back to back. I don't, you know, um, I was supposed to fight the, the Welsh guy, John Phillips, and he dropped out, and they offered me some, they, you know, they wanted to put me on a later car, but, you know, I was like, man, I already bought plane tickets and, you know, this, that, and the third, so I need this first whole thing to pan out. So, you know, they tried to get several other people that were hurt or didn't want to fight or whatever, and then, uh, you know, Mick Minger was like, I know someone who will for sure take the fight. So, you know, I, I think Marcus Perez, he'll be game, and, you know, he's definitely not scared or timid or anything like that. He'll, you know, come out there and move forward at the... Uh, you know, ready, be ready to touch that chin a little bit. Yeah, another interesting thing about the matchup is both of you guys are 9-0. and So, you know, someone's always got to go, and I I, I think that you uh, plan on giving him his first L, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm always confident in my skill level, you know, on the feet, on the cage, on the mat, uh, top or bottom, or the counter-striking or being offensive with it. So, you know, I think Marcus is going to have a tough fight on him. And, you know, you got that football background. I mean, do you think that's your – Biggest asset because man, when I watch you fight, bro, you're so physical. Um, I'm not sure. I think I'm physical by nature, anyway. You know, I've always kind of been like that. Um, uh, I think that uh, being coachable uh, is probably my biggest upside, and I'm relatively new to the sport, so you know, I got good at striking just as fast as I got good at jujitsu. You know, I'm not just a jujitsu fighter or a, you know, a, a, a striker, you know, I can do it all, because, you know, I learned them all at the same time, instead of, you know, training just jiu-jitsu until I was, you know, 20 years old, and then I started, started striking, or vice versa, or whatever the case may be, you know, just as long as I've been striking, I've been doing, you know, grappling, so, um, I think that's where, uh, I think that's the biggest upside that I have. So it's interesting, man, because this guy you're fighting, he's actually got wins over UFC vets, and, you know, I know we spoke about it, he... He beat Ildemar Alcantara, and he also beat Paulo Tiago. I know you remember back at UFC 95 when uh, Paulo Tiago knocked out Josh Koscheck with that that uppercut left hook combo. But this is, you know, his fight with Paulo Tiago was in 2016. He went to a split decision. Are you at all like, man? If I was fighting guys like that, I'd be knocking them out in the first. Um, you know, I, I actually watched that fight. You know, the mat was really slippery, so it was hard for anybody to get any, you know, hard shots off. And- you know, they, they they were doing the slip and slide thing on the canvas. So, you know, maybe he went in our politics about early, you know. Uh, he certainly had the the uh, speed and athletic um, uh, advantage over him. And he certainly landed more shots. I think he wanted to fight for sure. Um, but, you know, maybe on a different service, surface, uh, he finished his policy out of 
Uh, so you're giving him the benefit of the doubt. Oh yeah, absolutely, man. You know, like you know, the guy's good. You know, you can't you can't deny you know the man's record. You know what he's accomplished so far in his career. So you know, definitely not taking him lightly, and uh, you know, preparing for him just like you know he was Calvin Gaston or Michael Bisman or GSP or any of the other guys. And uh, what different challenges does he bring to the table compared to the guy you were supposed to fight, John Phillips? Uh, John Phillips, you know, I feel like he was very one-dimensional. You know, he threw, uh, you know, ones and twos, and, you know, all he did was throw hands. You know, he didn't kick very much. You know, he can't grapple at all. Um, he comes straight forward, and I've catch a lot of angles. Uh, Marcus Perez is the complete opposite. Uh, he throws kicks. He throws spinning attacks, you know. Um, he throws wide looping shots as well as straight shots, flying knees and all that other uh, good stuff. And, you know, he's got a very, I think, a very solid ground game. You know, he submitted that Ian Heinich uh, cat with an arm triangle from the bottom, which, you know, I've never seen that done. You know, I've never had that applied, so I don't know the kind of pressure that puts on your hat or that actually shows or if Ian was just, you know, you know, being a puss or what. So, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, uh, you know, he, you know, he, He's, he's quirky, you know, he attacks from, you know, uh, uh, different angles and whatnot. So he'll definitely, I think, be the most athletic guy, um, the most well-rounded, um, and as well as, you know, uh, you know, uh, most creative guy, I'll say. And, you know, uh, you know, your fight against Brendan Allen when you win five rounds, do you think that uh, helped out your, uh, you know, just fight game a lot, man? Because to go five rounds that early in your career when you're, you know, a guy that gets a lot of first-round finishes, uh, did that help you a lot? I think so. You know, I always prepare to go five rounds, but you don't know what going five rounds feels like until you go five rounds. And those first three rounds, you know, we fought at quite a pace, I feel like. And so, you know, I know that, uh, I can really push the pace, uh, especially for three rounds. Uh, so, you know, going with five, after going with five rounds. Yeah. So, I mean, with that being said, man, I mean, are you thinking it's going to be a first round knockout versus Marcus Perez? I know you're prepared to go the three round distance, but when you visualize it, how do you see it going down? Um, you know, like I said, he throws a lot of looping shots. My shot comes straight down the pipe. So, um, I, I really, you know, so far as I tell you, spiked out in my head. And, you know, sit back by myself and, you know, just kind of um, dive off into my own head and imagination, if you will. Um, I see, you know, he throws, he stands left-handed. Uh, well, he goes left-handed, right-handed. But when he's a left-handed stance, you know, he really leaps in with a, a wide uh, um, right hook. And I think that's where uh, I catch him with the straight left down the pipe. Hey, so, you know, I can't let you go without a couple fight predictions, man. And it just got announced that Max Holloway, he's defending his belt in the rematch against Jose Aldo. Now, do you simply think this is a case where Max has Jose's number? Or do you think Jose can make the proper adjustments and come out here and dethrone Max Holloway? Uh, I think a guy of Jose's of, uh, Jose caliber is always a threat. However, I think Max Holloway, I think his swagger and his confidence is on 10 right now. I don't think there's a lot of guys seeing or touching him right now, so... I think the Max Holloway finishes him again. And, dude, look, this is your weight class. Do you think Robert Whitaker is going to face GSP, or do you think GSP is going to vacate that belt? He better. He better vacate the belt. Robert Whitaker is going to knock him out. He, you know, Yo Romero couldn't take him down, an Olympic silver medalist. You know, I'm not sure how many times Robert Whitaker has been taken down um, in his fight career. Not much. And I think that that's the only way that GSP stands a chance. I don't think that he can strike with Robert Whitaker, and his only chance to get uh, Whitaker to the ground, which is not going to happen. Dude, were you surprised how GSP looked coming off that layoff, man? I mean, super dominant, and he looked like a middleweight. Uh, I don't know, man. Everyone knows this man doesn't have a very good, very solid ground game or take down defense. So, you know, I think that the, uh, you know, I think the UFC kind of picks who they want to promote. And uh, gives him, you know, good fights. And the guy's never fought the middleweight, hasn't fought four years, and gets to come back and fight for the title. Come on, man. That's not fair to the rest of the division. So they're, they're just putting together money fights and, you know, giving everybody a belt, uh, an interim belt and whatnot. So, you know, um, I think that he's a, uh, a yeah, I think he, he, should, he should go back now to uh, welterweight just because, you know, Bisping's not the biggest middleweight, and there are certainly guys bigger, stronger, more powerful, and more skilled than, than Bisping in the division. So I don't think the GSP lasts long in this division. 
Man, and speaking of your division, man, I mean, what do you think about the current state of it? Because, look, middleweight's always been super exciting. I mean, you had Anderson Silva back in the day, but now all these guys that are coming up, like Paulo Boracina, Tiago Majeta Santos, even a vet like Derek Brunson, they're all looking better than ever. What do you think about your weight class right now? I think they're, um, I think they're looking for new talent. to uh, You know, the, the top 15, top 20, a lot of those guys are like 38. 35 years old, so they're definitely getting up there, coming up on a retirement, I think. So they're looking for new, exciting fighters that like to go out there and finish fights and uh, that draw crowds and sell tickets. Well, Eric, man, want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us right here, right now on Half the Battle. It's always a pleasure. The fans can follow you at Eric Anders. Eric, any message for them before we go? Uh, tune in December 9th, man. You know I'm always looking for an exciting fight, looking for a finish, and uh, you know I don't think that I've had a boring fight so far, so um, expect fireworks uh, to hit the ground. Expect uh, you know crazy transitions and um, you know maybe a submission finish. But uh, definitely look, looking to put my hands on a, a Marcus Perez there. Well, Eric, thanks again for the time and best of luck in the fight, man. I appreciate you guys having me. Absolutely, man. Have a great day, Damian Brown. You're on half the battle with Dan and Shaq. How's it going, man? Going awesome, man. It's good to hear. So, dude, I mean, look, the fight's right around the corner. It's coming up this weekend, you and Frank Camacho. And, look, Frank's the kind of guy that comes to scrap. You're the kind of guy that comes to fight as well. It's an intriguing matchup on paper. Are you excited about it? Yeah, look, man, I'm pumped. I mean, it's going to be nice not to have to look for a fight in there. Uh, I think the fight's going to come to me. So, it should be pretty awesome for me, awesome for Frank, and even better for the fans. Yeah, Damien, uh, nice to meet you, man. This fight has a uh, fight of the night written all over it. In your style, man, I enjoy it so much because, you know, when you settle into a fight, you really let your hands go on the inside. Um, I'm sure you're looking to do that against Frank Camacho. Um, now, are you going to come in here a little more uh, safe, or are you just trying to be the typical Damien Brown, the guy that likes to put on a show for the fans? I'm just coming in being me, man. I mean, I mean um, you know, I've made plenty of promises to the UFC and the matchmakers that, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's the last fight or the first fight on my contract. I'm going to come in there. I'm going to fight. I'm going to do my thing, and um, the results will be what they'll be. So, um, you know, I can't really I can't really fight, you know, depending on what's going on around me. i just got to fight. So uh, I'll just come in there and be me. Man, how do you feel about your career progression so far? Because every single fight, you're looking better. I know your last fight didn't go your way, but up until that point, man, you were looking great in there. So how do you feel about this progression? Uh, man, you know what? I feel good. I, I feel like I'm developing uh, good as a martial artist and as a person. And um, I, I feel like, uh, you know, the last fight was a single punch changed everything, but I definitely felt like I was up on the scorecards in that first round. I uh, felt like if it had it went the distance or even had it went into the third round and he started fatigue, then I would have finished the fight anyway. But, you know, that was our game plan was to go forward, put his back against the fence and get the finish, and it didn't happen. But, um, you know, like you said, we look good up until that point. So I feel like I'm developing well and, and I'm doing the right things to be better each fight. And uh, I think you guys will see a better version of, um, of me this time around as well. Now, Damien, uh, I actually met you uh, in Atlanta. That's where I'm from uh, when you fought uh, Cesar Arzamendia at a UFC 201. How did you enjoy our city, man? Man, I loved it. Um, it was, uh, like, like, I loved Atlanta. And, uh, you know, I went to a few things while I was there. Went to the zoo and all that sort of stuff. Went to a gun range and fired some uh, some weapons that I normally wouldn't fire back home in Australia. But, um, man, there's lots of homeless people out there. <laughs> I gave out heaps of water. Um, but yeah, no, it was a it was a beautiful city, man. I had a, I had a blast. I love I just love traveling. So I don't think there's such thing as a bad city. It's just a different experience. Do you uh, so do you enjoy you know fighting in your uh, home your home country or do you uh, prefer traveling to the states? Um, you know I like fighting at home, but uh, it does come with a little bit of extra pressure. You know you you always get your family there or like my my parents fly to every fight in in australia so uh you know and i had i had my mum in new zealand as well so it's it adds a little bit of pressure you know getting knocked out like i did in front of your parents i don't think about it going into it but afterwards i felt terrible about it so uh, you know uh, probably the best fight like over the 27 fights and the best fight i've ever had was the one in the states i had a blast I took some mates over to corner me and you know it's just real relaxed real chilled and no pressure and we went in there and we had fun and enjoyed the trip so that was probably my best experience. I'd like to fight over there again. But, um, 
you know, finding home is it's nice because you don't have to uh, try and get all your family over there, the added costs and all that sort of stuff, as well as the travel and the jet lag. So that's that's really the only bonus about fighting here, man. I'll fight anywhere. How'd you develop your aggressive style, Damien? I know we've been talking over the years, man, but it's really showing your last two fights, especially, man, the John Tuck fight. You take If someone starts to slow down against Damien Beatdown Brown, you're going to go out there and put it on them. So how'd you develop that style, man? Um, <clears throat> you know, man, I just noticed from real early on in my career that um, I had the gas tank to go three rounds. I mean, I, I don't do hill sprints, man. I, I don't do freaking beach sprints or anything like that. Look, you know, I, I do it occasionally as part of my programming, but it's not like every Saturday or every Sunday I'll go out and do a sprint session. You know, I, I just think that some people have got the gas in the tank, and um, if you've got the heart to match the gas, then, you know, you, you put it all on the line for three rounds, and that's that's how you come out. You know what I mean? Like, um, yeah, I just I just noticed early on in my career that, that I had a, you know, a good endurance base and that I could go three rounds, and I, I think I credit that to a um, extensive childhood and teenage years in rugby league and um and and probably my military time and, and fitness so um match that with the the never never say die attitude and live by the sword die by the sword and that's it's, it's inevitable that's just what happens and you know i've been following uh, you and frank camacho on instagram and it seems like both of you guys are really picking up for this uh training camp uh what do you think this fight is going to come down to in the end? Me not getting hit, like not not getting hit, but me not getting hit with one of those sledgehammer overhand rights or left hooks or something that he throws. You know, like he throws big punches, man. He comes for the kill. Um, the dude's trying to kill you. He'll take your head off with every single punch that he throws. And you know, I think uh, as long as he doesn't land a clean shot, I win the fight. But um, yeah, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say that I go out there and knock him out or anything like that. Like. You know, I don't really know how the fight's going to play out. All I know is that I've trained for three rounds, and if it goes the distance, you can you can uh, rest assured that I'll I'll put in the work to get the decision. So, um, yeah, I think um, you know, as far as putting in the work during the camp goes, I mean, I always put in the work, but um, he's dropping from 170 to 155. It's not as comfortable as fighting 170, so you, you kind of got to put a little extra work in, and you know, do all the little extras that you would have in the past, maybe cut the corners on. Um, so yeah, you know, I expect that he's working hard and he'll come in a different fighter. So does that excite you that, look, this guy's going to come to fight you and, you know, you had a fight with Alan Patrick and, you know, he tried to hump your leg. He tried to make the whole crowd boo, but then you took on John Tuck and John Tuck actually came to fight. So do you get up more for these kind of fights where the dudes actually want to fight you? Um, I think they're easier fights to get ready for. You know, you got a guy like Alan Patrick who's boring as shit, uh, doesn't want to fight he just comes in and and sort of holds you down i mean like when i fought that dude i had more sub attempts than he did and he's a three-time world champion black belt like um you know you, you got these guys they're hard to train for because you don't even need to train your striking for that you just train your takedown defense you know obviously i had six six days notice it's a little difficult but if you had a full camp you just train your takedown defense and then you you got a game plan around their boring ass style if you got someone like john tuck i mean you know that even though he's going to try and take you down, he's not humping your leg, man. John Tuck's taking you down and trying to finish you. He's going to take you back and choke you until you're asleep. You know, or if he stands up, he's game. So fighting those guys is easier because you know when they get you down, they're going to go for it. Scrambles are going to happen. And as long as you can out-scramble them, you get back to your feet. So, um, yeah, I like the fight against Frank. You know, I think um, he showed against Jing Liang that he'll try and finish him on the feet. he try to finish him on the ground. That creates holes, creates scrambles. Scrambles create exciting fights and fans get what they pay for. So, you know, Damien, I feel like every time we talk, we have to mention how Australian MMA is looking more promising than it ever has. And now you guys have a world champion, man. You got Robert Whitaker, And, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, he's the undisputed champ. What was it like for Australia when Robert Whitaker went out there and defeated Yoel Romero? Oh, man, it was... um. It was like tear jerking for, for I guess for for any you know diehard fans would have been, you know we've never had that before you know what I mean it's like um you put that next to Australia making the World Cup in the soccer for the first time in 28 years which we did you know a decade or so ago um it's it's just it's amazing you know what I mean like it's a it's an amazing feat um you know I like the fact that we both fought on the local circuit at the same time and. 
you know, even as a UFC fighter, I find some some kind of inspiration in someone like uh, Rob Whitaker. You know, like he's taking it a fight at a time, man, putting that win streak together, and then when you get there, things happen. He's never talked shit. He's been respectful. He's always remained a martial artist. He gets better. He does good things for the Aboriginal communities down here. I mean, he's he's just a legit role model, and he's young. You know what I mean? Young, married, kids. I mean, the dude's the dude's got it worked out. So it's um, yeah, it's it's inspirational story, and um, it's definitely motivating for anyone that's a fighter. And as a fan, I, I think it's it's tear jerking watching him win a world title. I also think that if GSP defends his belt, I, you know, I love GSP, man. I've I've followed him my entire career. He's one of my favorite fighters. But I think Whitaker puts him away. So. Damien, I watched all your uh, fights uh, earlier this morning. And, man, when, when you get on the inside and, you know, when the blood's uh, dripping and that sweat's on the body, I mean, uh, your hands are really beautiful, you know, when you're uh, nice and flowy. Uh, where Do you have a striking background at all? Yeah, so um, probably for close to a decade or so, or maybe like eight years or something, I did um, karate as a, as a child. Uh, I just went away from it through sort of through my teens to play um, play other sports and um, and then I started kickboxing when I was like 23 or something like that. When after my deployment to Afghanistan, I started um, kickboxing again. And so yeah, I, I did striking mainly, but uh, in my earlier fights I wrestled because people in Australia couldn't wrestle and I have a rugby background, so I, I, I sort of took to wrestling pretty good compared to most Australians and. Um, and you know it worked for me but um the higher the level you know i just go back to back to my background and get better at my striking and now now i just strike so you know i I can i can fight wherever i want to but um yeah i do have a striking background so look damien you finished people in 17 seconds before you've gone the full five round distance before i've seen you knock people out in the first round when you envision this fight how do you think it's going to play out um you know i i uh, i don't want to give away too much of my game plan by the by the way it's going to play out because I will very easily um but uh you know I think Frank's going to come forward um I can assure you I'm not going to back away three rounds and um you know if the fight goes to the ground I think I win by submission uh if the fight stays on the feet um you know third round finish maybe a decision but uh I don't see the fight ending early unless he ends me so um you know I I don't, I don't think that, I don't think that it'll be a first round finish. I think it'll be a five and Well, Damien, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us right here, right now, on half the battles. Any message for the fans yeah. before we go? Yeah, man, follow me. Uh, follow me on YouTube, Damien Beatdown Brown, or uh, social media Beatdown One Five Five. And uh, shout out, you know, to my sponsors that helped me, and um, and uh, also Frank for being respectful, man. I love a respectful opponent that comes in as a martial artist and lays it down. So, um, yeah. I'm looking forward to it, man. We're six days away. Damien, thanks so much for the time on Fight Week, my man. Best of luck in the fight, and we'll talk soon. Thank you, guys. Have a good one, eh? You too. Peace. There you have it, folks. Colby Cummington, Marlon Chito Vera, Eric Anders, Damian Beatdown Brown. Thank you so much for checking out this very special edition of Half the Battle. Make sure you follow me on Twitter at Best Fight Picks. Follow Shaq at MMA Genius 05. Subscribe to Half the Battle on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Stitcher. Hook up those five star reviews. Shaq and I will be back later this week to break down UFC Sydney, Fabricio Vicavala Werdum versus Marcin Tibura. So until the next time, let's cash these bets.